Hey everybody, Scott Wilkinson here, the editor of avsforum.com. Today I'm in the home theater of Andy Deli, otherwise known as Glimmy on AVS Forum. Andy, thanks so much for having us. Yeah, you're more than welcome. So how long have you been in the uh, AV hobby? I would have to say since childhood, mm. teenage years. <laughs> you know, as many of us have yeah. been, yeah. And uh, so you started being interested in this and it, you've developed a career out of it. You're now yeah. working in the broadcast industry. That's true, yes. Uh, and that's a Technicolor. Yeah. And as an electrical engineer, you manage, uh, you do a lot of systems design and Systems so on, engineering right? and um, custom you know, products for the company. And here we have another example yeah. <laughs> of your work <laughs> yes. in your own home. <laughs> yeah. uh, when did you join AVS Forum? I joined in 2000. Mm -hmm. So one yeah. of the early ones. Yeah. <laughs> and how long have you been thinking about doing this theater? Well, uh, I started out in a previous house with, you know, building the big screen under the wall. And then when we bought this house, we did the same thing. We tore out a fireplace in the family room, built the big screen in. Then came high definition, so we got the high def big screen. But about that time, and primarily after looking on AVS Forum, I realized that doing something like this is possible. Mm -hmm. You know, because before you look at audio video interiors was a popular magazine. I used to work for it. Million dollar theaters, mm -hmm. and, you know. But the ABS Forum really showed me that it's well within reach to do this. And since I'm a very hands-on, a lot of it was DIY. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it made the, uh, had the, the uh, property space to do it, so we decided to put an addition on. So this is actually an added-on room to yes, the house. Yes, this is right off the corner of the house. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, and it was built for this purpose? Yes. To have a theater in it? Yeah. But the uh, contractor, all they did, you told me, was uh, put up the drywall and then you built the, the rest of the theater. Yes, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a poured slab and then just a, you know, standard construction two by sixes. Mm -hmm. And then it was a drywalled shell and then they left and then I did all the build out of the theater. So were you, you weren't particularly concerned with sound isolation, with sound getting into the rest of the house? No, actually this um, addition is tied onto literally the corner of the house and it's actually loosely coupled. It's designed in an earthquake to shear away. Ah. So um, there's really no sound coupling. Um, and like I said, it's two by six, heavily insulated, just based on building codes these days. Mm -hmm. So I really wasn't too concerned about sound getting in or out. And um, that was back in, 2003 when it was finished and really haven't had any issues with sound. Now, if I have heavy bass playing, I can go outside and hear it. Mm -hmm. But certainly by the time you get to the end of the property, you can't hear mm -hmm. it. So, And your neighbors aren't really close by, no. so it's not a problem there either. What about acoustic treatments in the room? Well, it's um, pretty standard. Um, the um, A lot of these tips, I guess you could uh, trace back to Dennis Erskine and his contributions to the uh, theater construction. And fine for, contributions yes. they are too. The um, the lower level where you see the black, that's um, that thick acoustic foam. I can't forget the name, but mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's hard, like, um, hard yeah, kind of fiberglass. Mm -hmm. Then above the chair rail, it's soft mm -hmm. padding. Mm -hmm. um, and then the stage, of course, is sand filled, mm -hmm. three layers of plywood with a roofing felt in between, followed all those tips. And uh, I was a little, um, skeptical of the sand thing, but I gotta tell you, it really works. Really? It, it really, you know, you don't have any vibration. Mm -hmm. Wolfers sit right on it. And you built all of this yourself. Yeah, well, the the, uh, the build out that you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long did it take? Well, How long the, was the um, build? The, uh, the idea came about in um, I guess October of 2002. Um, we had a plan basically by February and then you had to go through all the permitting and financing, of course. So they actually broke ground in June of 2002. They were finished by October, and then it took me almost a year to, to finish up the rest. Mm -hmm. And that was probably evenings and weekends kind of yes. a deal? lots of evenings and weekends. <laughs> <laughs> now, not only did you build this room within the shell, uh, you also built the speakers. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, those are... Um, the actual cabinets are the Parts Express kits, and I think they're actually made by DIY Sound. I think mm -hmm. they're just second um, sourcing them, I don't know. But mm -hmm. um, I didn't actually design those speakers. Right. I just built them as kits. None of them are visible. So basically, you know, I got good drivers, and then we just throw some black paint on there and put them back there. I don't need to go to the trouble of having them cosmetically appealing. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. just need to sound good. Now I noticed that you are using a Greyhawk screen, non-perforated, mm -hmm. so it's not acoustically transparent. Yeah. 
the speakers have to be outside of the screen area. Right. Uh, why did you decide to do that? Well, um, you know, I was involved in several DI um, digital intermediate rooms at work, mm -hmm. and the um, the thinking there was these rooms are for good video and color. We don't want a perf screen. So in a lot of color correction rooms, they do not have perf screens. They have, now, when you get an audio room, it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. You want a perf screen. So I basically went by that and figured that you know I knew about the Moray problems. I was a little bit concerned about that. And I was also concerned about black levels mm -hmm. because you know. I was going to ask you why did you use a gray yeah. rather than because you're totally light controlled. Yeah, it's, it's totally black in here. We turn everything off. Yeah. But um, I, I still went with a gray hawk, and um, I have to say my black levels I'm, I'm satisfied with. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they could be better, but uh, uh, now I do lose light. That's a point nine gain screen. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but uh, all in all, I've had that screen now for ten over ten years. So mm. I'm happy with it. Uh, one other interesting thing about this room, as I look around, is you've got all these monitors uh, looking, uh, showing different things. You've got the audio levels, you've got your security camera, you've got a waveform monitor. Uh, what led you to to do all of this extra monitoring in here? I mean, it's very cool. Well, it it's, it serves some, uh, I should say, limited purpose. I mean, the audio metering is all calibrated. Mm -hmm. um, all my speakers are bi amp so there's one display. I have 22 channels of amplification, mm -hmm. so I can see every channel. Mm -hmm. I have a spectrum analyzer. And these are off-the-shelf programs from a company called PAS Products. Um, they're very reasonably priced, and um, I have a dedicated computer for each one. Mm -hmm. Then I have some waveform monitors for looking at the video. And then the security cameras just come in through some scanning converters mm -hmm. so I can call them up. And all this goes through a 16 by 16 component matrix for VGA. So I can basically put anything on any screen or anything in any combination thereof on the screen. I can even pull them down onto the main screen if I want to. And that's all controlled via uh, eye roll. Eye roll on yeah. an iPad. Yeah, and then there's a secondary automation computer that actually does the switching. Mm -hmm. Speaking of computers, I have to say your equipment room is very impressive. And uh, you've basically taken all of your content and put it on uh, more than one server. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I started out, I was a heavy DVHS user back in the days. <laughs> I remember DVHS. Yeah. And remember the old... It was old, cool. It, yeah. it looked great. It, uh, but you know, you can never get through a movie without a hit. There's mm. always one glitch. Mm. But. Uh, you know, and back to the days where the people remember the Dish 5000 modulator, mm -hmm. where you could actually, with the Panasonic set-top box, record movies mm -hmm. off uh, uh, satellite. Mm -hmm. So I amassed quite a collection of uh, movies. And the very nice thing is, back in those days, there was no HD light. So a lot of these older movies I have are true 1920 by 1080. Oh, wow. So that kind of, you know, I think, yeah, I could buy the Blu-ray, but uh, you know, almost no, as good. No real need to, yeah. right. So, and then about 2011, when, you know, just when storage prices came down and um, I have access to a lot of discarded servers that are not quite good enough for, you know, true uncompressed video, but they're perfect for compressed video. I have about, what is it now? About 70 terabytes of storage. 70 terabytes of storage. And you told me earlier, like a thousand movies or something? Yeah. Wow. Wow. And the software you're using to run all that is J River, right? I think it's a fantastic program, you know, for the price. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, it's a, a worldwide development group. They keep adding things, so. And what really surprised me was the upconversion quality. Uh, prior to um, J River, I had some broadcast quality um, image enhancers and mm -hmm. the dreaded DVNR, you know, that they talk about. I have one of those. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> Actually, they're obsolete, so they're oh, basically man. off the scrap pile. But right. I had I a, have a Terranex yeah. back there, which is yep. a fully professional yep. quality uh, processor. And when I used to watch DVDs, I'd run through all that gear and, you know, got a very good image out of it. But after getting Jay River, the, the quality of their up conversion is not quite that good, but it's it, the convenience factor overwhelms it. Yeah. So now I just run everything out of J River. Two audio streams. Um, for AC3, I just have one stream that comes out off the motherboard. That's Dolby Digital. Yeah, yeah, that goes through a lexicon where I get my, my Logic 7, mm -hmm. which I still think is one of the best um, up, up mixers available. Mm -hmm. And then for Blu-rays, where I have the advanced audio, I have a separate um, digital output card that sends those out. So mm -hmm. I have basically two audio streams coming off it. Right. 
Well, speaking of the audio system, let's take a moment to talk about that. It's, uh, at the moment, it's basically 7.1, right? More or less. So the front LCR is a triamp, mm -hmm. so there's a power amp on each driver. Then there's stereo right. subwoofers, and I should explain that. It's, it's stereo subwoofers in the sense that they're bass managed. Everything under 80 hertz goes to the subwoofers in stereo. Mm -hmm. Then the LFE is mixed in. Mm -hmm. And via the, um, the iPad, I can decide whether I, uh, I want to have um, LC and R bass combined, or I can have just the LFE track, or I have options how I can mix that. But basically it runs with um, below 80 hertz with the LFE mixed in. Mm -hmm. Then of course the center channel. Then there's side left, side right, which is now surround left and right, and then rear left and right. Mm -hmm. Then there's a rear center, that's a synthesized rear center by mixing the, uh, or the difference between the rear left and right. Mm -hmm. Then I went for Atmos. I have the speakers installed, they're on amps, and now I have a simulated Atmos where it's just done with delays and frequency shaping mm -hmm. um, that basically simulates the height channel. But <coughs> when Atmos, when a reasonably priced dedicated processor comes out, it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. And there's two height channels as well. Mm. Uh, Front height, you mean? Yeah, yeah, which again, that's just done with delays and, and frequency shaping. I have a, a mini DSP processor I built that has uh, eight, eight channels or, uh, or eight cards in it, so it's 24 channels. Mm. And, um, you know, I could do various things with that, but I really haven't done much with the wides yet. Mm. What would you say were your biggest challenges in creating this room? Um, the finish work, um, doing the fabric, that's something that uh, I've seen it done and, and work many times for over the last 20 years, but you know, it's, once I started doing it, it, you know, it, it turned out pretty well, but yeah, it turned out. It did, I mean, it looks beautiful. Yeah, and, and the woodwork, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm a weekend woodworker, but I'm not, certainly not a craftsman at it. And so what about future plans in this room? I mean, it's never done. We all know that. Well, no, actually, um, I just finished putting in a masking system. It's not operational yet. Um, the Four-way masking, right? Yeah, there's a motor on each panel, and um, so I can do a nonlinear, you know, if I have to. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's all computer control, but I'm still, still working on that. <laughs> that was just done. Um, of course, 4K is coming. Um, it's here, yeah. obviously, but it uh, is. You know, it it is. Just, uh, I'm not a first adopter in that respect. Not enough content yet, and not uh, the projectors are still a little pricey. So here's one inevitable question. How much did it cost? Uh, too much. <laughs> 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 no, the, the, the base building, for the construction and all that, the contractor cost was about all in with the architects was about eighty thousand mm -hmm. dollars to build the building. Mm -hmm. And I ration that or rationalize that as well. That's an addition to the house. Right. The value. It's an investment. Yeah. Then the rest of it, uh, um, it's hard to figure because you know it's you know three or four trips to Home Depot every weekend, fifty bucks here and there, but right. it adds up. Uh, yeah. So I'd have I, to I've say. I've heard it called the, the tyranny of small numbers. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it definitely adds up. So I could say it went to, including the, the first, my first projector, which was a sharp uh, 10K mm -hmm. DLP, I would say it went to about 120. Total. Well, yeah. Including the building of the room. Building right down to the carpet furniture. Well, you know, that's, that's a lot of money, yeah. but you know, as you said, it's certainly a lot less than probably Technicolor yeah. spent on their theaters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's my midlife crisis. Some yeah. guys buy a boat. Some right. guys uh, sports buy a car. sports car. This is mine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. drive a sports car. <laughs> well, very good, very good. And the name of the theater, it's a GMG, and a lot of people would think that might be kind of a reversal of MGM, but yeah, not so, eh? No, we. Um, my wife uh, belongs to a, a golden retriever rescue. Oh yeah. And um, so we always have plenty of golden retrievers. And at the time, our three dogs were Gus, Misty, and Glimmer. And that's where Glimmy comes from, by the way. So that's how it got its name, the GMG Home Theater. Because they were sitting around all, during all this construction. Well, actually, they lost about three quarters of their yard. No, they had to fence it off. So <laughs> and they you do something to honor them. Yeah, huh? they deserve it. <laughs> Very good. Well, it's a beautiful room, uh, Thank and you. I really appreciate your spending the time talking with us about it. Thank you. So that's it from Andy Deli's GMG Theater, and I hope you've enjoyed our visit. I certainly have. And I hope that all of you have the opportunity to fulfill your home theater dreams in any way you possibly can. Until next time, farewell.